Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I just felt all day long that the order of the service would be a bit different tonight. And the Spirit of God has brought some of you in here for a particular reason. Some of you tonight, before we go any further, this is your night of salvation. And this is the time now to get right with God. You don't have to wait like usual until the end of the service. There's a great message about how God wants to prosper you tonight. It will not work, nor will it be uh, appropriate for you to even try to operate in the principles of God until you're right with God. And tonight, you know who you are. You know that tonight you have come into this place and you are out of sync with God. And I'm not just talking about being in sin. You haven't really released your life to God. You really know who God is, yes. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. But before we go any further, it's not about what you have in your head. In fact, when people talk about God, you get right in there with them. You're in agreement with what they say. You're not against God, but you're just not wholehearted for God. And you know that's you. And it's time now to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. Jesus makes a statement in John third chapter, you must be born again. And the reason he's saying that is because there's a new experience. You're leaving the old life behind and you're coming into a new relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way you can do that, nobody can make you do it. Nobody can hit you in the head with a Bible to make you do it. No angel can come down from heaven and hit you in the head with a two by four, make you do it. It's got to come from your heart. I know where I'm at. I know I'm not right with God. I know I can go deeper with God. I know I can get right with God. I know he loves me. I know he died for me. I wanna give him all of my heart. I wanna give him all of my life. Did you know that he won't steal your heart and life? It's yours. It's your heart and your life. And he's not a thief, he's not a crook. And he gave you a free will choice to either keep it and do your own thing are to give it to him and let him deal with your heart. And tonight, if you haven't given him all of your heart and you haven't given him all of your life, tonight, before we go any further, it is your night of salvation. And you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? How How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all of my life? Here's how. Simply get up out of your seat, get in the aisle, and walk boldly down here to the front. I want to shake your hand. Then we're going to pray together that you invite Jesus into your heart. And there's some people you need to come. And it's always the first couple of ones that are difficult, but who will be the brave one that needs to come that'll start the rest? And you know it's you. You know it's you. You just need to get your stuff, get out of your seat, get down here, and come right now. Just come, don't clap, nobody claps, nobody claps. We're not here shouting for anything. I'm fishing right now. You're scaring away my fish when you shout and scrap and clap. Go take you fishing, throw rocks in the water while, I, while I'm fishing. People are coming, that's it. Just come, you know it's you. It's time to get right with God. You know, there's just a bunch more, just simple as this. How simple is it to say to yourself and be honest with yourself and say, you know, I, I, I've been messing up. I need to get right with God. How, how, how simple is it for you to be honest with yourself? Is it that difficult for you to be honest? Or you want to just ignore it and hope it goes away? Why do you think you're here? This is a divine appointment. You had appointments with doctors and attorneys and painters and plumbers. Now God is saying, I brought you tonight so that you might get right with me for the rest of your life. This is the best walk you will ever walk. This is the greatest walk you will ever walk. 
And if Jesus, in Easter, we've got this giant crown of thorns going up here. It's enormous. And if Jesus can walk that walk for you, you can walk that walk for him. You can get out of your seat. I, I'm telling you, there's at least 10 more of you. I mean, I could stop right here and we could all be happy. And aren't, Isn't Pastor Jim wonderful? He ministered and all these people got saved. Isn't he a great preacher? But I'll tell you what, I'll go out on a limb and be a fool for the rest of you. Because there's more of you that need to stop messing with God because if you die, you're going to go to hell and someone needs to tell you. And you can't go to God and say, God, I went to church that one night. I went to church without responding with all of your heart and all of your life. And you know who you are. Get your stuff, get out of your seat, and you come. I'll give you just a few minutes more. Come on, come on. It's not a laughing, joking time. This is a serious time to get right with God. Come on. Serious time to get right with God. Just come on up here just like these people. Just get out of your seat. Just come. Just come. Yep, they're coming. They're coming out of the family room. Bring your children. It's okay. You come. Come all over this place. You know, can I just be honest with you? You know you do not want to go to hell. Well, I'm going to tell you how to get to heaven. According to what the Bible says, you must be born again. Jesus said that himself. And if you're not, you're going to go to hell. And somebody needs to tell you. Just be frank. Say, well, I, I, you don't, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you're going to believe it when the fire of flames hit your butt. And you're going to say, thank God for that old man that told me the truth. So are you going to listen to the old man that's telling you the truth? Are you going to listen to the foolishness of the devil that wants to stop you right now? And you need to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. They're still coming. You come too. Come on. Let's don't go any further. Come on. Well, thank God you guys have come. They're still coming. I'm, now you can give the Lord a great big praise. Are you there? Here's what I want to do. All of you, <laughs> glad you came. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to all look. All of you look to your left. See this guy waving at you? Wave big, Pastor Joel. Wave real big. Yeah, okay, that's good. Wave like a man. <laughs> Pastor Joel's a good guy, no weird stuff. He's going to do three things. Number one, he's going to take you over there and he's going to beat the snot out of you. That's how this works. We're just going to beat you up with chairs and all that stuff. Is that okay? No, I'm only playing with you. The number one thing he's going to do is pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart because you, you need to invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross because you need him. Now you need to invite him in because he's a gentleman and he won't come in where he's not invited. So he'll lead you in a prayer to invite him. Secondly, he'll give you free stuff that'll take home, read about what to do next. What, what does God want me to do now that I'm saved? That little, little bit of easy reading information that will tell you what to do next so that you can get strong in Jesus. And third thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Those are fun people, friends, that will help you pray for you during the week, encourage you to get back to church, meet with them. They'll teach you four or five things out of the scripture that will make your life like Zoom when you realize what the truth is. And it's going to be great. Spiritual Personal Trainers. Get one. They're free. Everything is free. We love you guys. Only takes a moment. And then he's going to let you come right back in the church service. And then I'm going to teach you about the will of God on how God, listen to this, how God wants to prosper every area of your life. Can you believe that? You say, well, why doesn't he do it then? I'll show you why, and I'll show you how. It's right in the scripture. Make you crazy when you hear it. It's going to love it. Is that okay? So go with Pastor Joel right over there, and then we'll let you come right back in church service. Thank you, Pastor Joel. Big wave, Pastor Joel. Ha, 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 ha.
I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Why don't you stay seated if you like, or you can stand up if you like, or you can lay down on your face if you like. I, I don't care what you do, but I'm going to get down on my knees because I need God. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for tonight we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to see some church performance. This is not a stage. We're here as the body of Christ gathering together to hear from your word and from the teacher who is the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, as you bless us tonight with your wisdom. You've already blessed us with your presence, already blessed us with healing. Thank you for healing all these people, God. We, we just love them and want them healed, the Lord. We want them to know how good it is to be in your presence, how good it is to trust you. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit already. But also, Lord, we would ask that if you bless us tonight, that you bless all the churches in the Indian Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel, of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the planet this night. There are brothers and our sisters. We love them. We bless them. Ask you to prosper them. In Jesus' mighty name, the great big shout we all say, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. This is the journey into prosperous life. God really wants you to have a prosperous life. Jesus himself said, I went to the cross and he said, um, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. A lot of people don't understand that God really wants to prosper them. And there's a real journey for prosperity. We've been talking about this part number two, but can I just share this with you? Every single one of us in here need to pay attention for a moment, and here's why. Because you know darn well you would love to be prosperous in every area of your life. First of all, we have to, from part number one, define prosperity. Prosperity isn't just, but doesn't exclude, money in the bank. Now listen to what I just said. It's not just everything about money. It's not about money. You can have all the money in the world, be broke as you can possibly be, and in fact, you kill yourself because you're so down, depressed, discouraged, frustrated. <clears throat> life is rotten, and you can be the richest person on the planet and have a rotten life. Prosperity that God's talking about is a prosperity that goes way beyond your wallet, way beyond your checkbook. It's prosperity in your marriage or with your children, prosperity in relationships or job, prosperity with your home, prosperity with your future, prosperity at the end of your life, whatever it might be, that you feel and know without a shadow of a doubt that you're fulfilled in life. <coughs> Excuse me, from time to time, I think I'm going to do that as I... Take my healing tonight, like so many of you. And so prosperity is just something that you've got to come to a place of realizing that each person that's in here has a different perspective on prosperity. Uh, some people think prosperity is just having abundance of material things. Some people think prosperity is, is um, playing with the kids more often, going to a park. Living that kind of a life. Excuse me just a second. Some people think prosperity is not standing in front of thousands of people coughing. <laughs> <clears throat> That's where I'm at right now. Prosperity in each one of us is different. But God wants to prosper you. And until you know that without a shadow of a doubt, you're never going to be there. You're never going to have the prosperity. You're never going to have the faith for the prosperity, whatever it might be. Until the will of God is known, there's never faith that follows the will of God. Faith always follows when you know the will of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When you find out what the will of God is, then you've got faith to follow it. But if you don't believe that there's a God that wants to prosper you, you'll never believe God for prosperity, nor will you ever be prosperous in any area of your life. 
If you only see yourself as down, out, loser, that's what you'll be. Because the Bible makes very clear <clears throat> that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But also, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what you're thinking all the time is what you literally become a product of. And we see that in Scripture all through the Scripture in different people as we look at their lives. Like Joseph last week. Excuse me. Remember, this is so important for us. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. In Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verse 18, makes a statement. It says, you shall remember the Lord your God, speaking of God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. A lot of people don't believe God wants to make you wealthy. Let me tell you something. Why is that verse there? He gives you the power to get wealth. A lot of people think I've got to have brain power to get wealth. I've got to have the right favor. I've got to have the right position. I have to have the <coughs> right education to get wealth. A lot of people say I've got to be in the right place at the right time. Have you ever heard that expression? A lot of people say I've got to have money to make money. Have you ever heard that expression? But according to this, the Bible says all you need is the power of God. God, he makes it very clear, gives you the power, whatever it is it's going to take you, to do something to get wealth. It isn't your education, it isn't who you know, it isn't your timing, it isn't anything at all. It's just really about, you know, whether or not you can believe God for the power at where you're at to open the doors that you need opened in your life. Very important for all of us. Remember in Psalms 37, verse number 27, it gives him pleasure to see the prosperity of his servants. If you're a servant of God, <coughs> excuse me, he gives him pleasure to see the prosperity of your life. He wants to prosper your life. You and I have got to come to a place of knowing that. Last week we talked about in order for this to happen, we're going to have to be a people that understand very important for us to understand the source. Right off the bat, the source of your prosperity cannot be your checkbook. Right. <clears throat> cannot be, if you will, where you work. Cannot be the favor you have on the job. Cannot be your boss, your family connections. Cannot be your education. The very source of everything you have and ever will have has got to be God. If you don't get the very first thing off the table right from the beginning, you will fail. The source isn't giving me more money. The source is saying, God, it's you're my source. So therefore, no matter what you have, God's the source. And that's what you're looking for all the time is what God can give you, God can make out of it. Second thing we talked about, which was really important last week, was if you'll remember the relationship. You've got to understand there's got to be a relationship of trust and obedience on your part. If you don't have a trust and obedient relationship with God, who is your source, <clears throat> then therefore you will eventually and inevitably, inevitably fail. Third thing that we found out is not only your, if you will, your relationship, but your responsibility. What is it that God requires of you? Does he require just wanting to bless you and you don't have to do anything about it? No, there's something you're going to have to do, get in and make do. You're going to have to stand, keep on standing, be strong at tough times. You're going to have to keep your eyes on God and keep going forward with things of God. There is a responsibility that every one of us have. It's not to sit back and do nothing, but to get in and do something. And then fourth thing that we talked about last week is the connection you have with God, which is the most important. The connection means this. Who are you connected with and where do you live your life by? Who do you live your life from? What is your source of existence? What is it that you live every day by? Your connection has a lot to do with where you're going to grab, number one, the source and have that responsibility and also take, if you will, the uh, uh, relationship to a higher, greater level of trust and obedience. 
So a lot of times we're not connected correctly. God is something in our life, but he's not everything. We're expecting God to prosper us, and yet we have a lousy connection with God. I mean, we love God as long as, you know, everything's going good, but as soon as things are going bad, we run from God. We start to get mad and ugly at God, when in fact God really wants, if you will, a people who are going to understand who he is and have a relationship in good times as well as bad times with him. In fact, it's in the good times and bad times that you and I are going to be judged by God. So this very important is what is your real connection with God. Tonight, I want to go somewhere with you, and I, this is what the Spirit of God told me. Things that keep prosperity away. <clears throat> and I thought what we'd do is we'd look at the negative side of this whole thing. In other words, I can learn oftentimes from the negative, not always from the positive. The positive as I show you what the scripture says for you to do. But if I show you what the scripture says for you not to do, then you can figure out what to do. Are you following me? In order to understand this, I want to take you, if I can, to Ezekiel. I'm playing the Old Testament with you for a little while. Ezekiel's an interesting character. He's a prophet, if you will of God in the time that's very difficult for Judah. Judah is, is in the midst of their 70-year bondage with Babylon. They've been taken off into bondage. King Nebuchadnezzar's coming in, taking all of Judah and all the people out, brought them to Babylon. There in Babylon, they're all become servants in the year about 505 B.C. And what takes place is an amazing thing. Here the prophet is raised, a, a real priest and prophet in the land, by the name of Ezekiel, comes along and he starts talking about, because the big question in the hearts of everybody that was taken captivity is why? Let me ask you a question. Listen to this. This is so fascinating. Let me just go there with you for a moment. If things were going good in your life, you had more than you ever needed. You had more prosperity than you could probably ever use. Things were going real good. And then all of a sudden, the door was slammed. Bang! And the whole country was in siege and moved off into some foreign land. And you were now, instead of being in prosperity, you were now a slave. And you looked at this and you said, why? Why is this happening? And it's really fascinating some of the things that Ezekiel says and writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's really talking to in a people that are very prosperous as they have gone into captivity. And they don't know quite why. They haven't yet. Have you ever been so close to something you don't know the answer to it? You can't see the forest through the trees is what I'm saying. And here are these people, they can't see the force of the tree. They cannot figure out why it is that God took them out of prosperity. Now listen to this. And brought them into captivity. From prosperity to captivity. And it's really fascinating because you will always find that God judges and looks at his people what they do in a time of prosperity. Prosperity. In a time of adversity, he knows what they will do. They will all run, listen to this, to God. 9-11 happens. We had a 900-seat sanctuary in those days. We had 5,000 people in church that Wednesday night with 900 seats. Adversary, this... When there was a problem in the land, the people run to God. And guess what? That's the normal thing. But when there's prosperity in the land, that's when the people are judged by God. And so what we find here with Ezekiel is exactly that that he's writing. Go there with me, if you will. In Ezekiel, let's take a look at the 16th chapter. Now, as we look at Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, I want you to mark it in your Bible because we're going to keep coming back and forth to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. And he's talking about, when he talks about these cities, so that you understand this, he's talking about a city called Sodom. And when he talks about a city called Sodom, he refers to the city as a sister. 
In other words, he's saying your sister Sodom. In other words, you have, you're a city in itself, Jerusalem, and your sister Sodom is no different than you. So the analogy here is a city, but he's really talking about the attitude of the people. Remember this, keep in mind that they are very prosperous people, but God saw them and allowed them to go into captivity because why? Now listen to this, a lot of times people say this, if God wants to prosper, I mean, why doesn't he? And if God wants to prosper you, and you finally come to that place, and then you have to say to yourself, then why doesn't he just prosper me? Because what if the prospering you brought a curse to you? And what if prospering you was so mishandled that it would take you into captivity instead of blessing? And doesn't God know that? Yes. So what are some of the things that we have to watch out for in our own life so that we don't end up in captivity when God starts to prosper and bless us? Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, are you following me? And he writes these, remember, the cities that he's describing are like groups of people. Verse number 49, it says this. In fact, verse 48, I'll read it to you. It's not on the overhead. It says, as I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor your daughters have done as you have done as your daughters have done. Verse number 49, look this way. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter, and then he starts to say four things that they operated in in the midst of their prosperity. Watch this. Had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, and neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. Four things, big place. That caused them to go from prosperity into captivity. And for some of you that are in captivity, here's the thing to do to get into prosperity. Are you following me? Is there anybody listening? Very important for us to see this. I'm going to go back and forth, mark it in your Bible. Let's take a look. It says, verse 49, look. <clears throat> this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. In other words, here's what they did. They were very prosperous, very successful. They had a lot going for them. They had a lot of abundance. It was a very wealthy time, very wealthy place. She and her daughter. In other words, there was other smaller cities around. Number one, had pride. Circle of words, had pride. It's really interesting. One of the greatest killers to your future of prosperity is something simple called self-importance. When you see yourself as self-important, you are no longer good for anything. Because there's a whole world out there that's not looking for some special person. They're looking for help from somebody who's real, tell the truth. And when you get into yourself, this self-centeredness, this pride, if you will. What you're really saying is the world around me, it really rotates around me. It's all about me and my feelings and my life and, and my existence and these people fail because now their conscience was all about themselves instead of someone else. And especially their God. It wasn't even about their God. And yet it was the very God that they were not involved in. It was the very God that gave them the prosperity. It was the very God that kept them and kept them blessed. And they left the God that blessed them and into themselves, which is a common practice. You see it all the time. Somebody will come up through the ranks and they're as humble as can be until they get successful. And bang, man, their success turns into a curse. Because there's not very many people can handle success. All of a sudden, it's all about what I can do and who I am and my, my ability and my coolness and my intelligence and my wit. It seems to gather the people. It's all about what I want, what I feel. What's important in my life is me. And these people that had that failed, and 
I want to take you, hold your place right there. It's just kind of fun to look at. But let's take a look about self-importance, uh, just, if you will, for a moment. And let's check it out, if you will. I'll give you a scripture in Psalms, the 17th chapter, verse number 10. In fact, let's just pop it up on the overhead. They had closed up their fat hearts. One translation says they were enclosed in fat. It sounds like you read that and you think, God, what in the world's being said? But what's being said were in that, those verses right there. I should have highlighted, I don't know if you can do this or not, John. They had closed up their fat hearts. It really means they're enclosed in their own self-righteousness and their own self-ability. Enclosed in their own fat hearts. It's all about themselves. They can't go anywhere without taking themselves. Their life is about themselves. They think about themselves. They're self-important. They're self-centered. Everything they do, they don't care about you. They care about themselves. And with their mouths, they speak proud. And all of a sudden, here comes one of the detriments to the future, is what you're thinking and speaking and how engulfed you are in yourself. You say, well, if... I'm not engulfed in myself. If I'm not closed up in my own fat of self, then what should I be closed up in? And it's a simple answer. In God. We were never to be self-absorbed. Never were we designed to be self-centered. We were always designed to be God-centered and God-absorbed. Never were we ever creative since the fall of Adam and Eve. Even before the fall of Adam and Eve. It's not about what we think, what we want, our will and our way. It's always about his will, his way, his want, his desire. And we've got to get back to that. In order for you and I to activate the prosperity that God wants to give us, we're going to have to get off of ourselves and get on him. Is anybody listening? Now, in order for that to happen, we're going to have to go back to Ezekiel. Because that's number one was self-absorbed. But I, I think the next one was really, really fascinating. If you got a rock Bible, you're going to have to turn the page. And it says these words, which are so fascinating. It says, well, the second problem they had was fullness of bread or fullness of food. Someone says, what in the heck? What's wrong with being fullness of food? That's a good thing. God's not talking about having a lot of food in your pantry. God's talking about where you are so full of material things. I mean, they didn't have stores to go rack up clothes and cars and boats and second houses and motorcycles and all the stuff that we collect nowadays, but they were so wrapped up in material things, what was important to them was they had an abundance of food. In other words, the material things that they had were greater than their relationship with God. And when material things become greater than your relationship with God, all of a sudden you're out of order, and guess what? You're getting ready to go into captivity. And that's what we miss all the time. So he makes this statement, they had fullness of food. And so here's number two. Number two, if you will, write it down. It's, it's good for you. Material satisfaction. They were like, all of a sudden you get prosperous and you become satisfied in what you have instead of satisfied in who he is. Is anybody listening? You see it all the time, preachers. Sorry to say it, it's so sad. They start off really humble, really caring, really loving. Church starts to get bigger and bigger because they're doing things the right way. And all of a sudden, man, instead of them being the servant of the church, the church becomes the servant of the preacher. It's the same thing in business all the time. We start off, we do all these great things in business, and we, we, and all of a sudden, we our material satisfaction, a satisfied life, comes from Jesus Christ and Him only. Doesn't matter how many houses you have; He's not telling you not to have them. <laughs> That's the stupidity of people that think, "Well, I can't have that because I got to stay humble." Can I tell you something? It's not about the house. It's not about the car or motorcycles, not about the boats, not about what you own, what you don't own, how many shoes you got in the closet. It's not any about that. It's all about your heart towards him. That's what this is all about. And have you ever seen people, 
They find their satisfaction in something else other than God. A guy comes to me recently and he says, Pastor, he says, I haven't been in church in a while. I said, man, I haven't seen you for a long time. He says, yeah, I bought a house. I said, well, I thought you lived over here. He says, I do the second house. It's over on the river and I'm really having a great time. But you know, if I don't go visit it every weekend, I feel bad about it because I'm making payments on it. And all of a sudden his material things become more important than his relationship with God. Can I tell you something? When your material things become more important than a relationship with God, you have just done something. You're, you're going to go out of pos- prosperity. You're going to get into captivity. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Let me give you a verse on that, which is kind of fascinating. And this is really fun because it's, a, if you will, the <clears throat> wonderful verse of, um, of Revelation, the third chapter. Verse 17 says... <laughs> Jesus himself is speaking. It's kind of a shock. This is a red letter in your Bible. He says, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of nothing. Don't tell me they don't have prosperity right there. And here's how God sees people that act that way, that put their wealth in what they have. They got it all. And God looks at him and says, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And let me just add one more, really stupid. Because when you tick off God, you are stupid. Come on, somebody. And all of a sudden, when you start taking material things and material things, remember, keep in mind what I just said. God didn't say you can't have material things. You can't have material things have you nor can they run in your relationship with God. Because your relationship with God has got to be greater than any material things you ever had. I can't tell me people start to be successful and fail in life. Could have had it all, failed in life. Break your heart. Could have had it all, just starting to get abundant. And all of a sudden, starting to think, just they got it all together, they can go do their own stuff. Live in a world of materialism. Instead of the things of God. Third thing, go back with me, if you will, to Ezekiel. Let's take a look. I like number three. He makes this statement, a bundle of, uh, abundance of idleness. Man, wait a minute. I would think that having an abundance of idleness, I mean, that's like having enough time to do nothing. Has anybody ever said, I wish I had enough time to do nothing? Well, then you have enough time to do nothing. You wish you had time to do something. And I think this, for everybody that's over 65, let me talk to you for a little bit. You're out of your mind if you want to retire. Number one, you can't afford it. Because 10 years are going to go by real quick and things are going to change again. And then 50, but, but the most important thing is that you'll spend three or four months in retirement doing nothing and hardly wait to do something. Because you were not made by God to sit around and do nothing. You were made by God to produce fruit. And the Bible says in John the 15th chapter, listen to this, that anybody that doesn't produce fruit is pruned and thrown into the fire. You are here to produce. As long as you have a breath in your life, you can produce something. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. So here in their abundance and in their prosperity, they had a lot of time to do nothing. And I think that's great for a day or two or a week or a month just to do nothing. But man, don't try to live the rest of your life that way when you got God on the inside of you. When you got God on the inside of you, it's not retire, it's refire. Because there's something, sure there's a next generation coming up and we need to make room for that. Sure they're going to be smarter than you'll ever be. My goodness sakes, I don't know how to turn the TV on. I'm still learning how to do that. But but I'm here to tell you something. Can I just say this to you? Listen to this. Uh, You're not stopping me. You're going to bury me, but you won't stop me. And when I'm buried, I'm going to do something in heaven. I'll be cleaning the streets, doing something. I'm going to do something. See, idleness is the playground for mischief. Idleness is a playground of problems. 
And a lot of times people in prosperity sit back, do nothing. And you know, some of these people that are the richest people in the world, you know what their problem is? They're bored. And when someone gets bored, especially when you know who God is, you are a mess because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Is anybody listening? Let me give you a verse on it because you're going to love this verse. It's a great verse. If I may, lazy in life was number three, if you didn't write that down. Number three is lazy in life. Ecclesiastes 10:18. Right past the book of Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. 10th chapter, verse 18. Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness, the hand of the house leaks. Did you know he's not talking about a building or a house? He's talking about your life. And because of laziness, your life decays. And because, listen to that, idleness, your hands, your life will leak. And when you get lazy and you get idle and you don't know what to do because you're in prosperity, God won't prosper you if you have an attitude you're going to do nothing. I talked to a couple people last week knowing this message was coming up. I said, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? I'd move to Hawaii. <laughs> One says, I, 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 I'd go live on the ocean. One says, I, I'd buy a big car. One says, I, I, all the money, pastor, all the money? Uh, I'd have homes in different major cities in the world. Can I tell you something? None of that will work. Because guess what? You're not made to sit around and do nothing. You're made by God to produce something. And you know what? You might as well know this. You're the happiest when you're working and producing. You know, you just don't admit it because everybody says, hey, you can't make job. I just don't want to work at all. And you got in there, well, I guess that's the way everybody is. I should be that way too. I hate my job. I think I'm that I did it. And we all just believe some stupid person. And you know darn well you love it when you work because you accomplish something. Has anybody ever worked and done something? At the end of the day, you say, woo! Now I can rest. Let me tell you something about this. A lot of people don't understand this, and it's a bunch of baloney for you not to understand. God implemented the Sabbath because he knew men needed to work, and men loved to work. And in order to stop them from working, he put in the Sabbath so they'd spend time with God. In other words, they'd just keep on working. And so when you get prosperous and you stop working, your house starts to leak. It's true. You know it's true. You say, Pastor, I'm just looking for a job. I know we'll pray for you later. <laughs> Praise God. I like this one. Number four. Here's, here's four things that these people did in prosperity that brought them to bondage. The opposite, self-importance, material satisfaction, lazy in life. Number four, look what it says. Let's go back to Ezekiel. It says, neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor, the needy. Number four, no effort towards the poor. I don't care who you are, if you take care of the poor, God will take care of you. There should never be, David, I'm talking to you, a church on this planet that sings songs and preaches the gospel without having the time to reach those that are poor. And even if it's like Debbie originally started with Pammy Hernandez, I don't know if Pammy's here or not tonight, and a little blue pickup truck filling bags of beans and rice, went to the neighborhoods. They wouldn't come to our church, so we went to them. Found a neighborhood that was totally crapped out. And this white woman goes in this neighborhood. She was, they said, there's not a honky in the neighborhood. There's a ghost coming down the street. <laughs> that's, how, that's how white she was in that neighborhood. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, and I, listen, this is my wife. And I'm saying, Deborah, you, I don't know if you should go to those neighborhoods. <laughs> she said, well, come with me. <laughs> Shut up. Have you got a life insurance policy up to date? <laughs> Tell me the truth. I'm, I'm not sure I'm saved. <laughs> but she, she, she's a real trooper, one in those neighborhoods, and that's where we got this. And can I tell you something? I've said this to you recently. We're just starting 
in the food distribution. Can I just say this? When we pay this building off, we'll start building houses, cities, for people that are underprivileged and poor, and we'll teach them how to get out of in poverty and how to get into the blessings of the Lord. You watch and see. You watch and see. That's what this church is all about because the day you stop trying to help, and that's why you bring your tithes and offerings into a place like this. We're reaching out in 140 nations. We're helping people all around the world just get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we're feeding the poor. We're in the prisons. We're in the we're, we're an organized group that's doing that. So if you're doing it by yourself, it's an organized group, and we can do more together than we can by ourselves. And that's why we're accumulating finances, not only just to have church service, but to make sure we reach the poor. Because when you reach the poor, you reach Jesus. And you got to start somewhere doing something. And that's what this is all about. One pastor, uh, Diego Mesa, who has a great church of our size of a church in Rancho Cucamonga, he said, I'm in a very influential city, but we have to reach the poor. And there's no poor coming to my church. I've been to his church. There's poor people in his church. And he says, well, there's nobody coming, so I'm going to send you the money. I like that thought. <laughs> then after a while, God convicted me. and I said, you need to stop doing it to us. We're not doing that for you. You've got to do it yourself. And now he's reaching the poor. So I gave the money back. Well, some of it. <laughs> the part we kept to teach him a lesson. Proverbs, the 21st chapter, verse 13, says these words. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. And for 70 years in captivity, they cried. Coming out of incredible prosperity, taken into captivity, we're the opposite. We're coming out of great poverty into prosperity. The opposite things we do that brings us into prosperity. And when we do them, we're going to start prospering. Why? Because God gives you the power to get wealth as long as you can handle the position of being wealthy. If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. And go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you. In the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior, I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.